Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the fourth installment of the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting. Um, just a quick compliance and disclaimer note. My name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps. For anybody who hasn't met me at one of our in-person conferences or hasn't joined us previously on the webinar, uh, you're all very welcome. Uh, for any new attendees, just to give you an overview of this morning's morning meeting, we've got two companies presenting. Uh, we run these every fortnight. Uh, each company has 30 minutes in which we break it down into a 20-minute presentation and then 10 minutes in Q&A. If you have any questions for either of our presenters today, please type them in the Q&A box and then I'll endeavor to try and get to all of the questions uh, within that kind of 10 minute window that we have. Please note the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel um, probably by close of business on Monday of next week. Uh, if you're new to Coffee Microcaps, you know, please feel free to follow us on Twitter, uh, YouTube, as I said, for the recording of this webinar and all previous webinars and future webinars. Uh, LinkedIn as well, where you'll find some longer form content from me. Uh, our two companies today, first up, we'll hear shortly from Mr. Sol Lukatsky, the CEO of Spirit Telecom. And then after Sol, we're going to be joined from Perth by Mr. Jeffrey Lay, the CEO of Fortive Limited. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Saul Lukatsky, CEO of Spirit Telecom. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mark. Thank you for the introduction and good morning. Uh, I'm sitting in Melbourne on a, on a pretty gloomy, ugly day, so I hope I can, uh, I can bring some value to, to the conversation and hopefully create some wealth um, while doing that. So, um, and uh, again, thank you for, for making the time. I'm sure it's very valuable. What we've got today um, is a snapshot about the company and a smaller version of the presentation that we completed on Friday to a mixture of institutional investors um, and retail investors and family offices on uh, Friday morning um, with a combination of trading results strategy update, balance sheet view, and that is all available on the spirit.com.au investors website as well for the full presentation, uh, which goes for about 51 minutes. And that also includes an update from our chairman, uh, myself, um, our chief operating officer, and Katie Bentley, who is one of our most recent acquisitions. So contextually, this is a snapshot presentation of the one that we did on Friday, with all the results being on market recently too. So I'll move into probably the first slide, and I hope that's come up, um, which is a little bit about not just spirit, but the growth that we are experiencing in the business. And then I'll move a little bit around what is the business model what is the target market and why are we executing successfully in this context? So I think I wanted to do this one for this audience, um, particularly up front, because I think when you're investing in micro caps, you want risk and reward mixed into one opportunity. So what you have here is a telco and information technology business that is growing materially through a period. So what we've done here, we didn't need to do this. We provided a market update with a Jan to April view of how the business is performing. And I'm, it's very pleasing to be able to articulate that we have had a record period and that record period is underlined by a mixture of organic and acquisition growth in what is probably one of the most difficult economic period for businesses and families globally. So on, the, on a Jan to April view versus um, 2019, we grew revenues from $5.8 million to 14.3. Um, in April, we had a four mil month. And why that is also pleasing is because Trident, one of our new divisions, is in its slowest period. Um, it services schools and aged care providers, and this quarter only makes up 15% of its uh, revenue run rate. And therefore, we've not only grown during the period, we've done it during um, materially one of our slowest quarters because schools refresh their services and infrastructure 
later in the year, which is opposed to businesses. So revenue growth um, up $14.3 million. But the one for investors that is even more important, I think, is recurring revenue. And recurring revenue in this business are long-term contracts with businesses um, where we provide high-speed internet, um, cloud-based services, infrastructure services, and IT support services. Really in that growth segments um, where there is structural change which is occurring in an industry. So really proud to say, not having we only grown the top line, um, but as investors, what I like to look to see is where is the annuity revenue stream? Am I, am I guaranteed not just growth in a quarter, but is there growth which is recurring? So as you can see from 5.3 year on year up to 8.6 mil in recurring revenues, they're locked in contracts with those businesses. And then solutions and project revenue, that's when we've gone into a business, signed a recurring contract, but we've said to them, we can also refresh your infrastructure and add over the top services. So we're integrating those products and services together. So I think hopefully that gives you a perspective, regardless, before we go into what the business model is, you're looking at a growth story, you're looking at a challenger brand, and exactly what a micro cap should be doing, challenging, taking market share off the big boys, and then actually executing growth. So I'm pretty proud with some of those results. In terms of what is the company's size, well, we wrote this last Friday, we were 70 mil market cap. Last night we closed at about 83 market cap. We've put on about 400 new retail investors over the last two weeks, which is really pleasing. On top of that, in March, we brought on seven institutional investors. So uh, we brought in the likes of, um, well, I, I probably shouldn't name them, but it's probably not appropriate given you're recording it, but some of the largest institutional investors with their small cap funds and um, micro cap funds joined us in March. Um, and we had a oversubscribed placement. So we placed $9.2 million and that was oversubscribed materially without going into what the bids were. That was materially oversubscribed. Additionally, we have some of Australia's largest family offices who have joined the register. And not only did they join the register, um, but they also, a lot of those family offices and high sophisticated investors topped up during that placement. I'm also proud to say that CBA uh, backs us. Sounds like a bit of an advertisement, but while we did the placement, CBA with these results coming through, increased our facility, our debt facility from $8 million to $11 million. So what does that mean in terms of balance sheet? We have approximately on, on a business that is a 75, 83 mil market cap, we have around $14.8 million of cash and debt to deploy for organic growth and acquisitions in that marketplace. Um, this is on market. We are in DD and negotiations around two or three acquisitions in this particular space. And we typically do that on an ongoing basis. So uh, on the acquisition side, we typically pay a fair, what I call fair value. On the smaller ones, we pay two, three multiples of EBITDA with earn outs. On the larger ones, we typically pay 3.5 multiples to five with earn outs. And the only acquisitions that we do today are uh, where vendors stay within the business. Uh, we only do acquisitions at this stage uh, with earn outs. So those acquisitions stay within the business and they have to grow with the business as well. So that's a bit of a makeup of, um, you almost have a live view of how the trading update is performing Literally, this is from Thursday, Friday, and it gives you the figures pretty much up to April. Next, for those who need a little bit more insight and aren't familiar with the business and what we do, um, these are the key business divisions within the organisation. Uh, we're circa on a calendar year in the 55, 60 mil run rate on revenue, so still a lot of opportunity on the side to go, both organically and additionally through acquisition. Um, we have three key parts of the business. On the left-hand side, you have Spirit X, and I'll do a screen share, and hopefully Zoom is kind to me, and allows me to show that to you. That is a internal uh, digital platform that we built all our, ourselves and own the intellectual property in 2019 and launched it in 2019, December and January. It's only four or five months old, and it allows businesses and resellers to um, service qualify and buy high-speed internet products um, 
in, in one system, in one place. So we also announced that the NDN will be going into that product range um, in, but, well, it'll be by Friday, but um, and we'll announce that a bit more to market in detail. But we're now the largest aggregator of um, high-speed internet for business in Australia. So think of an iSelect.com, think of a Kogan.com marketplace. That is that part of the business. In the middle, we've got Spirit Internet at IT. So we're also one of the largest fixed wireless providers of internet services um, in Australia. What does that mean? It's high speed internet in the sky. So what you now have is a business that's got a modern distribution platform on the left, Spirit X, but it also has its own network. And we're selling those services at a gross margin of 74%. And where our network can't hit it, we resell those services. So what is, what is it that we're trying to build? And in simple terms, the way I describe it, um, in the same way that I talk to investors or when, I, when my mother asked me what the hell I do, um, we're trying to build the office works of internet um, and IT. So what we've done is we've built the distribution platform, we've got the resellers, and over the last 12 months, we've acquired seven different companies and added the different aisles. So aisle one is high-speed internet, aisle two are voice products, aisle three are cloud products, security products, and so forth. So when we walk into a business with our high-speed internet, 12 months ago, we would have done that with a high-speed link and walked out of that, out of that organisation, be that a school or be that a aged care provider, and patted ourselves on the back and said, well done, we've put an $800 a month service into that organisation, which if you think about it, is pretty silly. Uh, we don't do that anymore. What we do is we walk in, put the high-speed link in, and then we open up for the cross-sell. We then have a conversation around their security needs. We then have a conversation around their cloud services. So the growth that you're seeing through the figures is not just around um, acquisition growth. We're bundling those products together and then having a greater share of wallet. So that monthly recurring revenue invoice is now becoming $2,000. Uh, we, you know, two days ago, we took a aged care facility of 11 sites off one of the large majors. We now provide them IT services and high speed internet. So that invoice went from um, just on the internet for three, $4,000, that's now a $15,000 monthly recurring client for our business as well. So that gives you a view of bundled services. Now why that is important is because that's what customers want these days. They don't want to be stuck on a phone call with Telstra and Manila for their internet and then for, with their IT provider for um, their IT services when their uh, laptops are not working or their cloud services or when they have a security breach. Unfortunately, but to some, I guess, in a perverse way to some advantage for us, security breaches are uh, one of our largest lead generators in that way. But they want one organisation. Why that's important technically is because we can find the security breach from the internet link all the way through to their actual hardware services as well. And finally, on the right-hand side, our most recent acquisition, Trident Technology Solutions, is our sophisticated um, IT service provider. Very strong in schools, aged care providers, and medical, which is a very key area of essential services. So why have we grown through this period? Uh, because we've got a diverse portfolio, and we also service a number of essential service providers. So to demonstrate that in terms of our business mix, you have a pie graph to the right that shows you the diversification of the recurring revenues, which is a mixture of business, education, health. We also have a small consumer portfolio, uh, but the predominant revenue stream these days is about 80% of our revenue comes through B2B. In terms of acquisitions, um, we've been very active. We've acquired seven telco and IT acquisitions over the last period. So I would say in terms of at, at these values, we've you know, $15 million in the bank, circa, we've got a lot more acquisitions that we can take advantage of. And what we're seeing is price expectations of vendors or sellers coming down dramatically. Deals that I saw valued at eight time, times nine multiples of EBITDA in January, we're now having conversations at four to five. So I, I think if any of you have seen me talk before, I talk about fair value. Um, and I won't pay anything other than a fair value for shareholders. And uh, I'm not a very patient person, but when doing acquisitions, patience pays off dramatically. And I will be patient with the right deals. And even waiting the last few weeks, I've literally seen um, vendors come to me who had different price expectations and discount 
their assets materially. So I think patience in this marketplace is critical and it'll be vital for us to get the next two or three acquisitions right uh, at the right price, it's, even if we just wait a little bit longer. Um, although we do want to get acquisitions done over the next couple of quarters, patience is, is critical. Once again, I talked about um, the symmetrical speed. So what do we offer for the customer? We offer symmetrical speed through our own fiber network. We're a one-stop shop for all of those and we're very hungry to execute acquisitions quickly. But the other thing that we've done is um, when we acquire, and I don't think I've included this slide, but if you get a chance, have a look at the longer presentation, we are very good at integrating. So Mark DeGuardia, who's our COO, uh, is the ex-COO and COO of IONET, um, who was acquired obviously by Focus, and he is exceptional at collapsing all the different systems. So to give you an example, we've integrated all the last six acquisitions um, that we did in 2019 and the one that we did in January this year, they're all integrated. They're integrated at the system level, at the brand level, at the marketing level, at the billing level, and Trident does actually stand alone. However, we've integrated that finance function already and the sales team work together. And Trident is stand alone because it's got some unique IP in there as well. So let's move, I'll focus on this point and I've talked to it already. Um, and I think this is a really salient slide for investors looking at value and looking a mixture of value, but certainty around income, which shows once again, the B2B revenue and the recurring revenue growing within that segment. So what is this recurring revenue? This is when we walk into a business and give them that high speed link, that cloud solution, um, that infrastructure solution and security. So what you then see here, outside of the entire result, on the B2B income revenue side, we've had recurring revenue grow by 92% on, the, on these four months versus 2019, and the entire income, sorry, the entire revenue line grow to 12.4 mil, right? So 92% up um, on B2B revenue, and then a very strong result on recurring up 92% to seven mil. So you've got a almost a 60% recurring revenue coming through the line with over the top revenue as a cross sell. The next slide is total contract value. And I will spend a couple of minutes here to pull this apart because it's critical um, for those looking at this organisation and what it does. So total contract value is in simple terms, sales, new sales that are coming on book. But the, the two points that I want to focus on here is that um, we're still growing during this period in terms of new sales. You can see that pending installations of our data is you know, up to two, is still at about 2.3 mil. Year on year, we've grown from 4.8 mil of new sales year in this period, all the way up to, sorry, oh, excuse me, 3.5 up to 4.8 with a total of 7.1. But what does this, what does this actually highlight? So on our data products, our average contract length that we sign is 36 months. So let's just say we did 100, 100 deals a month um, on our data services. The average contract length is 36 months, three years, and that's how we generate the recurring revenue. But the more important point there is why is 36 months important when you're signing these customers is because what it allows you to do is execute the secondary part of the strategy. And that's why the results are going up, is that it gives you three years to have a conversation around your value-added services that we sell as well. So if you can't sell those services, your IT services, into those high-speed link customers straight away, the sales team um, and the account directors on that account have three years to then have a conversation around selling those additional services over the top. And the reason that's important is because in this industry, if a customer is contracted, you may need to wait six to nine months to be able to open that conversation. So we then have three years, not just of recurring revenue locked in, but three years to upsell that customer and have that conversation, either when they're growing or there is a security event or where their contract is lapsed with their current provider. So total contract value is vital, not just in showing that we're growing from a sales line perspective, but it shows you the connection and the bridge between signing long-term contracts and being able to sell up um, the IT services, not just the high speed links or those SMBs. Finally, I won't go into this in detail, but this just shows again, 
the revenue growth coming through. Why don't we move into some screen sharing and I can show you the SpiritX platform that was launched in um, January, which is our unique intellectual property owned digital platform of how we resell products both to businesses and through our wholesalers and, and partners who resell our high speed internet products and third party products. So hopefully, um, I know I run a technology company, but um, it's not, Zoom's not always kind to me, so I'll do my best. Okay, great. So what we'll do is, we're a business, we're on the Spirit website, we want to find business internet product. Um, and we'll click through here and it'll come up with the product range that we have. So we've got two options there. We either want to um, inquire and speak to a business development manager, but we just also want to check our address just to see if there is a, what type of product is available. So at this point, we capture your details and every you are not provided with the products unless we capture your details. And that's just vital to allow us to keep all your contact details in our CRM um, for a couple of reasons. It allows us to find hotspots in the marketplace. So if we need to build network there, we can. Um, but also it allows us to obviously capture that data and have a conversation with you on product. So let's just for sake, I'll put 90 Collins straight in, um, but I can put a Sydney address in. And that in seconds, right, will show me the products available in that building. And there you go. You've got the Spirit products, which is the fixed wireless products coming through the top. Um, and then you've got a range of other products coming through. So what, what this actually allows me to do is move that around the building and that does an automatic check um, because we want to sell the, the, our product there instantly. What that's doing is checking all our radios, every tree, every building in the way, right, to allow me to sell that product. So I'm a business, I've found the product that I want, I've, put, I've moved my contract links and I, just, I don't want to talk to anyone or I've got two choices. I can speak to anyone or I can just order. And I click on the order button, put my details in and that'll move that order straight through electro, an electronic contract. So what you now have uh, in Spirit is you've got a really strong network and then you've got a digital platform that allows you to distribute it. So hopefully that gives you a perspective on how we're using digital and why this is important is because there's multiple providers in here. There's, there's Opticon products, there's TPG products, there's Vocus products. And the aim of the game here is if I can't sell you a spirit product, I will sell you something else because we generate approximately 600 leads through the organisation on a monthly basis. And I announced it on Friday. On Monday, we will be launching our first marketing campaign on Sky News. Um, on in the AFR section of technology, look out for us in AFR.com technology. Um, and also we'll have billboards across 14 locations in Melbourne and Sydney as well. So this will be the first time the Spirit brand is out in a mainstream market. So that gives you a perspective there. Um, so let me stop sharing and try to do one more thing. What I want to show you now, um, is if I go to the partner platform, Mark, just see, tell me, Mark, confirm you can see that. And uh, not yet, Sal, and we're just getting a bit tight for time as well, but it's coming up quickly, but we'll, let's look at how quickly. Um, I can see right, our right. Des desktop now. Quickly, I'll show you how the network's set up. So then you have the 90 Collins Street here. I'll quickly show you what you've got there is the network view. So we've aggregated multiple points of a network, which I think is, this is an engineering view that nobody can see at a customer level, but important for investors to see the size and scale of the engineering coming through. That's the network map in Melbourne that we can sell off. So I will move now to a new share and then move back to my PowerPoint. Let's, um, so I'm going to move to Q&A if that's okay with you. Um, uh, a question from the audience, is the recurring revenue in B2B all data network or is there an element of IT managed services and is all the data network revenue on net? I think, I think maybe if you can just go back and clarify that revenue split again. Yeah, so... Um, no, it is about um, the internet uh, on net 
So there's, well, there's two parts of that question. The internet network is around um, recurrent revenue is about 60% of that revenue and the other 40% is IT services. Then the, um, the uh, on-net component of that revenue com aspect is around um, 65, 70% on-net. Okay, great. And then we actually had one submitted ahead of time. Um, in terms of the acquisitions, are you looking to introduce a fourth customer vertical or are the acquisitions focused on the three customer verticals you have now, education, business and health? They're all a little bit different. Um, we've got acquisitions that give us very strong channel distribution across Melbourne, sorry, across Brisbane and Sydney. So my answer is, the acquisitions that we're doing, um, one of them does do that, gives us um, more verticals, more of those verticals in Sydney, but then a couple of the other ones give us really strong distribution, um, channel partner distribution where the SpiritX platform can be pushed out as well. So um, we, they're all a bit different, but I would say our focus is on more the distribution side um, and taking those verticals up the East Coast ourselves. And then another question that we got from uh, ahead of time. Oh, sorry, there's a few just come in here now. Let me tackle these quickly. Um, um, what's your key competitive advantage as you know, internet is a commodity product? Is it the, is it the service levels? Um, uh, there's, there's two parts. The key um, is, is three, there's two or three parts. The first one is definitely that we bundle the fixed wireless network with um, the IT services together. The customer is bundled in and it's hard for them to get out. They also want that because they've got one service provider, they've got one service level agreement, um, and they've got a better price point. Um, the other competitive uh, um, advantage is we're nimble. Um, and sometimes we're very modern is what you've seen on digital, but sometimes, you don't need to, you just need to be a good service provider. And the poor service levels at an Optus or, or a Telstra or, uh, or those, the, they are the gift that keeps giving, um, I, have to, I have to admit. Their poor service levels, their inability to pick up a call, their inability to service the customer in an old fashioned way um, with service and courtesy and respect is one of the greatest competitive advantages they're giving us. So sometimes competitive advantage is not only what you put into the marketplace, but also that the marketplace you're in is underserving those customers as well. Okay. And then we're very tight for time, but I'll just give you two quick ones. Um, one, it might be in the longer presentation, but um, with the acquisitions over the last 12 or 18 months, does the longer presentation provide organic numbers for revenue and income, i.e. excluding the acquisitions? Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, that's, no, no it, and, it, and it really is hard to, no, no, it doesn't. Um, okay. okay. Because it, it's, 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 it's the, because the, the questions, and not trying to be um, difficult, the issue is when you start to acquire businesses and then you start cross-selling across each other, the question is, what is organic versus acquisition? If, if Trident is selling multiple services and Spirit vice versa, what is the definition of acquisition versus organic? You effectively have create, you've executed to plan, which is cross-selling products. So then to split them, re-split them historically back versus acquisition organic is, it, it, it's not that easy because you are executing to a plan, which is a bundled service. That's, the, that's why it's not an easy question because then you're looking back and going, well, that one sold this, this one sold that, when you've executed to a higher price, to a higher invoice amount for that customer. Okay. So there's a few more questions, but unfortunately we're out of time and um, I've got to move on to the next one. But thank you very much. Um, and if anybody wants to get in contact with you directly, what's the, the best way to get in contact with you? Yeah, look, so I'm very open. Um, you can... Take my email address down. Um, it's s o l l at spirit.com.au. That's soul, s o l l at spirit.com.au. Um, and then obviously for the full presentation, uh, that's available on the Investor Centre 
um, on spirit.com.au on the right hand side and obviously everything's on market on uh, on the ASICs under um, ASIX code ST1. Okay, great. Sal, if you can just uh, cancel your share screen now and I'll bring in um, Jeff from Perth for our next presentation. Thank you. Have a good day. Cheers. Thanks, Sal. And a little later than planned, but um, we should have Jeffrey Lay, CEO of Vortive Limited, on the line with us from Perth. Jeff? Yes, hi. Can you hear me, Mark? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Perfect. Um, let me, without further ado, um, start with the presentation. Votif. Votif is a technology-based company um, specializing in cloud and cybersecurity services. We provide uh, these services to large enterprises uh, in Australia. Um, our ticket code is VOR. We'll, we were previously known as Transaction Solutions International, uh, TSN. We changed name about six months ago uh, to reflect our current strategy, which I shall cover in uh, subsequent slides. Our market cap is around $17 million, and we've got cash about $1.9 million. That makes our enterprise value about 16 million. Our cloud and cybersecurity services, Cloud 10 and Decipher Works, delivered a revenue of about 12 million in the last financial year, FY20, which is uh, ending 31st March 2020. And um, as a group, we delivered 1.4 million in profit. Separate from separate to this 1.4 million profit, we also own a 25% interest in an ATM managed services business in India, TSI India, uh, and that is valued at $9.8 million by an independent auditor last June. Uh, we have a highly experienced board and management team. Gary Foster is the founder of uh, the ATM business in India. He's the chairman of our board. Howard Digby is a tech specialist and sits on numerous boards of tech companies. And uh, finally, Greg Taylor, who joined our board last year. He represents Bombora Funds Management and is our third largest shareholder. On the leadership team, uh, I'm the CEO of the company and I bring 30 years of uh, professional service experience to the company. My director uh, at Accenture. The founders of uh, Decipherworks and Cloud10, the two companies that we bought over the last two and a half years, uh, make up the management team. Um, Michael Leonard, uh, Richard Tompkinson, and Stefan Halvarsson. They all have 20 to 30 years of experience in their respective fields and therefore very respected within the industry. Why um, invest in Votive? Um, let, let, me, let me skip this slide for now and I'll come back to this at the end. Uh, I'll go straight into the details of each of these points here. The first point I want to make is about the financials. We've delivered strong financial results uh, over the last um, 24 months. On both the revenue and profit chart, you will see eight quarters of uh, financial results that shows our growth trajectory. Um, for FY20, we achieved 11 million, 11 and a half million dollars in revenue compared to 5.8 the year before. On profit, we delivered 1.4 million in FY20 compared to 0 0.14 the year before. On cash flow, we delivered 1.7 million in net operating cash flow for the year. 
Um, and in terms of the impact of COVID-19, we do not see any negative impact uh, from COVID-19. During this period, over the last uh, few months, and what we can see in the current quarter, we continue to earn revenue by delivering our services to our clients, albeit working from home. We continue to win new contracts, and we expect a record quarter uh, in this current June quarter. We, we, we operate in a high growth um, industry. Our core business is in cloud and cybersecurity, which are top IT spending areas for enterprises. In addition to cloud and cybersecurity, we also provide cloud-based data analytics services to our clients. Cloud and cybersecurity are highly demanded by enterprises because of the widespread threat of cyber attacks, um, the, the, the risk exposure as more devices and data are connected online, right? And the costs both financially and uh, reputationally uh, of a security breach. Due to the continued strong demand from enterprises, cloud and cybersecurity is expected to continue growing at about um, 15 to 20% in the coming five years and expected to reach about 16 billion uh, by next year, 2021. Our customer base, we have a solid um, customer base uh, with blue chip clients who are loyal and have been repeat customers year on year for the last four to 10 years. Our top 10 clients, uh, which account for about 80% of our revenue, provide an average of about a million dollars of revenue per year to us. They're loyal and have been with us for an average of four years. And their average spend has increased year on year over the last few years. We will continue to build on this customer base by uh, A, uh, increasing the average revenue per year for each of these top 10 clients, and B, increasing the number of such key clients uh, beyond the 10 to 12, then 15 um, in the next two, uh, two, in the next, uh, two years. In terms of acquiring new customers, our strategy is focused on specific um, industries. Uh, these are high IT uh, intensive industries, industries that are reliant on information technology and therefore have a larger spend on cybersecurity services. This includes financial services like banks and insurances, um, government, utilities, uh, as well as um, education, universities in particular. We've listed a sample of uh, selected clients in here. Uh, note that not all the clients in here are in our top 10. Um, in fact, only two of these are in our top 10. Uh, we are very protective of the identity of some of our clients for, for two reasons. One is client sensitivity. Uh, our clients do not want us to publicize uh, their identity um, um, for marketing purposes. Uh, and two, uh, for competitive reasons, we too do not want our competitors to know who our clients are. But this gives you an idea of the sort of clients that we serve. Um, that, that is the security business that we have in, in Australia. In addition to that, we have uh, a legacy business, uh, apart from this security business that generated the 1.4 million profit last year. Uh, we have this 25% interest in TSI India. Um, 
while TSI India is generating revenue of about ten mil, uh, of about fifty million dollars and EBITDA of about one point seven million dollars, this is based on data from FY nineteen. These numbers are not reflected in our PL. Um, they're not accounted for in our PL. It is captured as an investment uh, asset on our balance sheet. This is valued at $9.8 million by BDO last year. This, um, the, the TSI India business owned and managed some 12,000 ATMs across India by serving 20 major banks and four major utilities. Uh, that is the core business. There are um, new revenue stream and new initiatives to create um, revenue streams, namely in the e-surveillance area as well as IPEG. Let me move on uh, through uh, uh, the, the, the uh, inorganic growth strategy that we've adopted. Um, we have embarked on a journey over the last two and a half years to acquire some uh, cybersecurity businesses. We will continue uh, in the coming years to look for more acquisitions that are complementary uh, to give us an extra boost to our organic board. Uh, or our organic growth. Over the last two and a half years, we've successfully transformed our business from a pure holding company of a um, uh, of the twenty five percent interest in the ATM business um, to a financially sustainable business, um, profitable and um, positive cash flow. Um, and having strong growth trajectory um, by making two acquisitions in Cloud10 and DecipherWorks. From where we are now compared to um, two, three years ago, we have a much stronger foundation to build on. Uh, we have more to offer to our acquisition targets when we make the next acquisition. We bring customer base, expertise, um, as well as a workable business model to attract acquisition targets. We will therefore adopt the same acquisition approach uh, moving forward that has so far worked for us. We will leverage on the foundation that we have built and we will ensure that the acquisitions are value accretive and the deal structure will minimize dilution to our shareholders as we have done in the last uh, two acquisitions. Um, over the last two years, we only issued shares amounting to roughly about $6 million um, in the last two and a half years for these two acquisitions. Profit contribution from any new acquisitions will drop straight to the bottom line because all corporate overhead costs has already been covered from these two first acquisitions. So our strategy over the next uh, 12 months, right, uh, is to grow organically the top line by about 25 to 30%. This should translate to a higher growth of about, say, 40, 50% uh, uh, in profit uh, compared to what we had done in the past, which is 30, 40% on the top line growth. Um, we will essentially be doing uh, what we've been doing to build the business organically, but with a few refinements and improvements. Uh, that's the organic growth. In addition to that, we will target to make one to two complementary value accretive acquisitions uh, over the next 12 months. Um, um, we have engaged a, um, a broker and advisor to source for acquisition targets for us. Um, 
We will also aim to look for opportunities to monetize our investment in TSI India. Uh, that means that if uh, there is an interested party to buy our 25% stake or the 100% stake in TSI India, both us and the 75% shareholder will entertain and explore those options. Um, and finally, we will also continue to fund our R&D activities. Uh, we spend about uh, $200,000 a year uh, to create intellectual property that will give us potential new revenue streams in the future. Um, the results may not show up so quickly as with all R&D, but it is uh, a small investment to make uh, to secure a better future for us in uh, future years. That, in essence, is our plan for the next uh, 12 months. Let me revert back to this. This is the summary slide of why invest in Votive. Um, firstly, strong financials. Uh, as I've mentioned, 1.4 million profit, uh, 1.7 million in net operating cash flow for FY20. Uh, we operate in a fast growing market, uh, growing at 15, 20% per year, and we've consistently beat the average market uh, industry growth rate. Um, we've got so solid customer base to build on. Um, they are, they, are, they are loyal, they are repeat, and they continue to grow year on year. Um, we're, we will continue to look at uh, acquisitions for in organic growth, uh, targeting one or two this year. And finally, we have a 25% stake in the Indian ATM business. Uh, which is valued at $9.8 million on our balance sheet. That, in essence, is um, the investment thesis uh, for Votive. Let me pause there uh, and take questions now. Um, thanks, Jeff. Yes, uh, we've got quite a few questions. A few came in uh, via email before, um, which were a lot around TSI India, but I think you've given a good overview of um, what the plan is there. Um, one of the ones that came in ahead of time was, um, do you compete directly with uh, Tessernet, uh, TNT, which is also listed on the ASX? Um, and if so, um, you know, where, where exactly do you compete with them in the market? Okay. Um, we, Tessarant is another cybersecurity services provider. They, they have got a similar business model, uh, but we do not compete with each other for two reasons. The service offering, cybersecurity is a very broad um, uh, space. Uh, the services that we provide probably represents about 20% of the cybersecurity industry. Um, each of these areas uh, are highly specialized and require specialized skill sets. So their services are different from ours, so therefore we do not compete with them uh, on either uh, the identity and access management side, nor the, um, nor the cloud security side. Um, secondly, we're different in terms of the customers that we serve. Uh, we serve a small number of very loyal customers. They serve a larger pool of uh, customers. Uh, so the target client base are different. Okay, thanks. And then in terms of acquisitions, are you looking at acquisitions to fill gaps from a product perspective or are you looking for acquisitions that will give you access to new clients? And on a valuation basis, say like EV to EBIT multiples, what are your thoughts on acquisitions? 
Sorry, can you repeat the last bit? What about EBITDA? The, you, what kind of multiples would you pay for, um, you know, businesses? So what, uh, it's a two-part question. One is, is it acquisitions to fill a um, product gap uh, or is it to uh, um, get access to new clients via an acquisition? And then what is yep. the, the kind of multiple um, you're thinking in terms of paying for these businesses? Yep. Um, uh, yeah. So um, yes, we are looking uh, for acquisitions. Uh, we're looking for complementary services and complementary clients. Both are important to us. Uh, we we will not look for a company that provides the same service uh, because we already have those expertise. There is much more um, services, as I mentioned, that we can acquire and will be beneficial to us. Uh, we would like to have the acquisition target bring, bring a similar type of client base as us so that we can cross sell our services into their clients and they can cross sell their services into our clients. That's where the real synergies come in. So uh, in essence, yes, we need we're looking for acquisition targets that can offer complementary uh, product services as well as customer base. Um, the, the EBIT multiple we're looking at uh, is around the four to six times multiple, four to five times multiple if you like. In the past, uh, uh, Cloud10 was acquired at uh, a four-time multiple and, um, sorry, DecipherWorks was four-time multiple and Cloud10 was about four and a half times multiple. Okay. Um, that would be roughly the yardstick that we will be applying as well. Okay, thank you. And then I know you said your average customer has been with you for four years. In terms of the revenue do they do they sign multi-year contracts or do they renew on an annual basis um 30 percent of our contracts are uh, annual contracts or multi-year contracts um 70 percent are repeat based on um projects that are a few months long so we get renewals on both. Uh, uh, the, the, the annual recurring one is the managed services. They are great for sustainability, providing us with stability uh, in revenue and longevity with a client, uh, but they are lower margins as compared to the um, three month long, six month long projects, which are, which typically have twice as much margin as compared to the managed services. Um, but of course, because they are project-based, uh, they create more um, uh, volatility in our revenue base. So we need a balance of both to provide both the growth, the margin, as well as the um, stability uh, in revenue uh, uh, for, for, for the company. And then just some questions around R and D. Um, I know you mentioned you will spend about two hundred thousand on R and D, but um, is R and D? Do you look at it as some kind of percentage of revenue that you kind of need to spend on an ongoing basis, or how how do you allocate? Um, I guess how do you allocate uh, funds to R and D on an annual basis? Yeah. Um... Yeah, we, we, we look at it as roughly about uh, uh, 2% of revenue. That's correct. Okay. And then is there um, SaaS kind product development from R&D to create more uh, recurring revenue? And is there kind of any product offerings in development in that, in that SaaS space from the R&D team? Yeah, we, we, we're looking at developing... SaaS base and PaaS base uh, products, uh, leveraging both uh, the expertise in Cloud10 and DecipherWorks. Uh, uh, 
to create products that we can offer to customers. Um, it is uh, highly lucrative, but um, it requires a lot of investment. So therefore, we are very picky in terms of what we do our R&D on. Um, we focus more of our efforts on um, things that we see real commercial value in the next, say, three years, as opposed to next five, next five years. So we're looking at things that are more um, nearer to commercialization. Okay, and then just there's a few questions then around, um, I guess, the growth and managing the growth. Um, what proportion of your staff is is billable staff um, versus permanent contractors? We do not have many contractors. Um, ninety percent or ninety five percent of our team are full time permanent employees. Uh, we use contractors uh, to deal to 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 cope with sudden spikes in uh, a, a requirement a demand for resource. Uh, so it is, if you like, a variable resource to make our workforce more elastic, right? But they only represent 5% of our workforce. Um, the, the staff that we have are um, mainly about 90% on, sorry, I'm just thinking here, nine, more than 90% direct staff, meaning revenue earning. Uh, they are facing the clients, they earn revenue for the uh, for, for projects so there are not many um indirect staff the indirect staff are basically myself the cfo and uh one of the sales staff okay great that's it so we are very lean we operate on a very lean basis uh we don't have many corporate overhead uh, resources I'll take two final questions because we're just at the top of the hour, um, Jeff. Um, so the, the first one is, uh, you know, there's a lot of growth, I guess, um, in the roadmap that you said. Um, what's your plan around capacity and capability to uh, handle those high growth rates? Um, in order to... It, In, in terms of um, the growth rate, we're expecting a 20% growth in revenue over the next uh, 12 months. That 20% additional growth will come in by just increasing our workforce by about 10%, right? The rest of it will come in through um, uh, better pricing, better utilization of staff and better efficiency. Great. So our cost base will increase by 10% through um, uh, salary costs. The other 10% will come in from uh, efficiency and pricing. Okay. So therefore, it's not a significant increase in capacity to cope with the growth, if you, um, if you like. Okay. And then the final question, um, I think you might have mentioned it in a previous question uh, answer, sorry. Um, what's the the rough split between managed services and project revenue? Did you say? Yeah, it was um, thirty percent managed services, seventy percent projects. Okay, thank they you. feed off each other, right? Uh, let, let me just quickly explain that part. Uh, uh, I touched a bit on that earlier. Projects are higher margin and they require higher skills, and that's where we are able to attract the top talent uh, to help with the projects. The managed services school is the one that we use to train up staff uh, so that they can then be transitioned into projects. Uh, when you are doing managed services for the client, you are there for multiple years. So therefore, we, are, we have our years on the ground. Therefore, we know of projects that we can then cross sell our projects services to. Um, at the same time, when we finish our projects, uh, with a project with a client, 
we would like to uh, also secure a long-term managed services that we uh, that we have with the client so that then we have got longevity with the client thereafter okay unfortunately guys we're um out of time i know the opening match has already started so i don't want to keep anybody from their desk and um, jeff thank you very much for um joining us from port i know it's um early over there and mm -hmm. um, if anybody wants to get in touch with you um with any further questions what's the best way to get in touch yeah i've, I've just uh the put down on the last slide here if you can see right my email address uh happy to answer any questions uh the best i could okay thanks yeah because there was some we didn't get to so if, uh, if anybody has further questions please um get in touch with uh, jeff directly and i would like to thank everyone for attending the fourth installment we'll be back in two weeks time that's june 4th Thursday morning, 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Okay, thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Th thanks, everyone, and thanks, Mark. Okay, thanks, Jeff.